Although it may look quiet on the outside, inside the first Christian Reformed Church in London, Ontario, things are cooking. Chopping, stirring, baking, mixing. It's a mishmash of food and fellowship. Deb Raukema is kitchen director. There's 10 people in each group that take home food. We cook large quantities of food um, for really good prices and we it's nutritionally based. It's called right. the Collective Kitchen, and every other week, the church opens its doors to Raukuma and her group. Together, they create meals that 10 participants get to take home and eat for the next 30 days. We make five different meals. We cook two main meals, uh, two different casseroles, a great large pan of homemade soup. Mm -hmm. We cook about 60 burritos. Each of them will take a half a dozen home. Mm -hmm. We do at least two dozen muffins per person, um, fresh fruit muffins. So there's five different meal plans that they get per box. Although people have cooked communally for centuries, the first formal collective kitchen began in Peru in the 1960s and 70s. Known as Comodores Populares, a group of poor rural women began purchasing and preparing food in bulk. By 2003, it had become one of Peru's integral food distribution systems, with over 10,000 centers. In Canada, Jacinthe Ouellette and Diane Norman of Montreal are credited for creating and spreading the movement in the mid-1980s. While collective kitchens exist all over Canada, Quebec has more than 1,300 of them. The kitchen has been running for 15 years, and what initially began with only five participants now feeds up to 20 people every month. To accommodate everyone, sessions are held every other Friday and broken into kitchens A and B. Kitchen A, I call it, that's the first kitchen of, of the month. Um, that's been a very consistent group for about 10 years now, and um, I have a kitchen B where I have mo about eight people and two sort of float in and out and I have a waiting list or if I don't have a list at the time I get all kinds of uh, referrals from different uh, agencies. While the group isn't exclusively for those with disabilities, many who take home food have either a physical or mental disability. Raukuma, who works in social services, cooked up the idea for the kitchen in the 1990s as government budget cuts threatened many of the food-related programs for the disabled in her community. They were saying, look, you know, you guys have to do more with less dollars. Some of the things that we actually ended up not doing were, were helping some of them doing food preparation, um, grocery shopping, and we thought, well, let's, let's do it all together and that we can sort of um, spread the knowledge and, and the fun around. Raukuma's years in the social service field has brought her in regular contact with the disabled. But she admits, for some of the volunteers, it was their first up-close and personal experience with disability. There were some misconceptions, certainly. There was, uh, I, I don't want to say fear per se, but there certainly is a, um, it's not in the daily walk of life. Mm -hmm. I would have to say the volunteers have risen to the occasion and they've bought as much as they've given to, to these people that we've supported. A lot of friendships and connections have been made here. Come Lord Jesus, be our guest. To make sure the kitchen is self-sustaining, each participant must pitch in $22 a month to cover the cost of groceries, she says. So we have $220 in a pot for groceries and the church will put in another 30 to 40 to help cover the buns and the meat and the cheese um, and some of the soup costs to feed the, to feed the volunteer crowd. The trend for some churches, says Raukama, is to move into the outskirts of town where there's usually more space and parking. But the church has committed themselves to staying in the downtown core, which she says benefits her group. We're on a bus line. We have um, a lot of the people who, who do participate in the kitchen have apartments all near the church or possibly within some walking distance of the church. So I think that was really kind of a key component when we when I thought of the concept. It was doable because of our location and I think there's a, a real strong need in this area to, to provide the service. What makes the program unique, says Rakama, is that everyone has a role to play. Those who take home food must also help prepare it at least once a month. A practice, she says, sharpens skills and builds community. The actual equipment needed to cook a nutritional meal, I think um, some of the knowledge is how to put a meal together is not always there. Mm -hmm. So when we can take them from step A to Z and send them home and they've participated um, collectively, they all feel they have done what they can do. Um, some people have physical disabilities, they can't hold a knife. Mm -hmm. so so we can find another task for them to do. 
Jim West is an integral part of the collective kitchen and knows just what to do when he arrives each week. I set up a tables and I uh, put a containers on to be sure they're clean. And if they're not clean, I have to take them out and put a, put a new one in place. West has a developmental disability and has been coming since the kitchen began. He says there are two things that have kept him coming back. What do you get here that you wouldn't get somewhere else? Uh, food. <laughs> is, that, is, yeah. is that what you mean? Yeah. And a friendship. I enjoy uh, the people here and all the friends I have. And I like coming back for Clinton Kitchen. Deb Raukema estimates that in 15 years, they've made 60,000 meals. But you don't get all those meals without a little bit of help. That's why twice a month, church members and staff, as well as people in the community, come together. Without volunteers, she says, Collective Kitchen couldn't run. Marty Brower is one of those volunteers and has been helping for over 10 years. Uh, I was asked to help out on a Friday morning uh, to volunteer. They were shorthanded one morning and um, I agreed to come and help. And I loved the program and what they were doing. Brower says working at the Collective Kitchen helps her realize just how much can be done when people are purposeful about being other-centered. Uh, we get so involved in our own lives with jobs and everything um, that you kind of forget about what we're here to do, is to help those who need help. It's gratifying for me, but I see how happy it makes them. Going home with their little basket of food makes me happy. Despite working 30 hours a week, Brower says volunteering has made such a difference in her life that she'd be willing to give up her paying job to stay in the kitchen. I will not work Friday. And I was asked to work Friday. And even if I would have lost my job, I probably would have went and looked for something else because I'm that committed to this program. It's really that important to you? Yeah. Okay. Despite the dedication of volunteers and participants, Deb Ralkema says that from getting the right ingredients to getting out of the church on time every week, there are still kinks in the well-oiled machine that is the collective kitchen. Sometimes personality clashes happen or situations happen in, you know, say between people that are coming in here and participating and I'll walk out and have to troubleshoot um, as far as perceived uh, insults maybe that has happened. Although it's difficult to do while holding down a full-time job, Rakama says she'd like to eventually host several collective kitchens to meet the variety of needs in her community. We used to do a kitchen with seniors. We do, used to do a kitchen with the downtown, the students at Western and at Fanshawe College here. Um, so develop some different types of kitchens that um, could happen. That would be a goal, I think. The collective kitchen is on hiatus for the summer, resuming in the fall. In the meantime, participants can buy boxes of food stored in the church freezer. Deb Raukema hopes that with every bite, they'll remember one important nugget. We're all a community and every person has the right to um, flourish, to develop all of their talents, whether they're in a wheelchair, whether they have Down syndrome. And um, I want them to come away with the fact that in the community of London, everybody's deserving of a place and respect. In London, Ontario, Bridget Entry, 100 Huntley Street.